I, I don't know, any study that showed that if you keep the glucose below this level, all this bonanza of benefits will, 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 will uh, you know, materialize. I, I, I don't know of a single study that says that. On this week's podcast, I had the pleasure of talking to Georgie Dinkov for the third time. <laughs> Every time we do this, I learn a lot. It gets to be kind of technical at times, but bear with us. And we both try to break it down and make it digestible for all of you. We get into things like carbohydrate benefits versus risks. We get into polyunsaturated fatty acids in cell membranes and the real cause of diabetes. We talk about fasting. Is it good? Is it bad? Should you take metformin? What are the real root causes of cancer and more? This is an amazing podcast, and I think you will learn a ton from this. You can find Georgie at Haydut, H-A-I-D-U-T dot me. Uh, that's his blog, and he posts those things on Twitter. But there are three episodes with George, Georgie. You can go back and listen to the first two if you want the full breadth of our conversation. But again, this is a really fun conversation. I think you guys will learn a ton here. All right, guys, that's it. On to the podcast. Enjoy this one with Georgie Dinkov. Georgie, welcome back to the podcast, my friend. It's good to have you. Thanks for inviting me again. Uh, I envy you being in Costa Rica. <laughs> <laughs> I was actually recently in Northern Virginia visiting my family, and so I was close oh. by. I, we didn't get the chance to hang out, and I for, I regret that. I should have tried. I know I should have called you. <laughs> yeah, I'll hop in. But, a, I have a car. I have a zip car, but I'll you know I'll hop hop in one and drive over. Oh my gosh, next time, next time. Okay. But it was interesting to see my niece and nephew because my sister's doing a pretty good job of raising them as like little 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 meat eaters and, and we got my we got my niece to eat raw liver which was awesome and I was talking to them about how it's important to chew your food because you need to yeah. develop your jaw. Yeah. And then I played Candyland with them and realized that that game is a psyop. <laughs> that game is <laughs> a total psyop. I mean, did, did your kids play Candyland? It's like, we're teaching kids like, oh, you just end up in Candyland. That's what you get if you win the game is candy. It's so funny. Right. You get all these awards, right? If you if you're acting silly. And I, I, I haven't seen that exact game, but um, some of the games that my kids try to play at school, I, I did not like them. So I called the teacher and said, uh, I would appreciate it if, if, you don't in, if, if you don't include it. But why not? It's so fun. I'm like, I just don't like the underpinnings. It's like if you, um, what was it? Oh, they're actually they're trying to teach the boys in school now to actually put on dresses. And I said, the hell with that. We're not doing this. <laughs> oh, <laughs> my gosh. Yeah. No, yeah. no. Yeah. And it was just crazy because my, my niece, I think after I was there for a week, I broke them of this a little bit, but they were just obsessed with candy. And I thought, oh, this is everywhere for kids. But anyway. Right. Okay. That's how the, 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 the industry ensures its future customers. You know, these people I are know. It's hooked. wild. Yeah. It's a hook. Okay. So let's start with this this idea, this question. So... There's a lot of talk right now in the health space about longevity mm -hmm. and the main, I would say the main paradigm that the mainly accepted idea is that the way to live a long time is to eat as little as possible, to fast as much as possible, yeah. yep. to not eat meat and the amino acids that are abundant in meat like methionine. Right. And then many people in, in, in what I consider to be kind of a brazen fashion go so far as to suggest Kind of, in a, I don't know, they suggest medications like metformin, like everyone yep. should be on metformin yep. and rapamycin. Yep. And for people who don't know, this is the third podcast we've done, and I'll link to the first two. But listening to a lot of your, your stuff and your ideas, I thought, oh, this would be a good place to start with Georgie. So let's just start with your perspective on that longevity strategy, and then maybe we can talk about fasting and we can talk about metformin because these are all the rage today. And I think that there's an important counter position to consider there. I mean, if you look at the studies, it's really interesting. Uh, it's become another political topic uh, and actually fits right into the whole idea of, of reducing carbon footprint and like eating less, right? Getting by on fewer calories and whatnot. And the way to sell it to the population, I think they, they, they kind of stumbled upon this finding from the early 60s where uh, different groups demonstrated that if you consume less calories, the, you could extend both the, the, the um, average and the maximum lifespan. Uh, however, <laughs> what the current political uh, interest around this idea doesn't tell is that these same groups actually said, I oh, know it can't be just the calories. Let, let's, let's find out and investigate what exactly is causing the increase in lifespan. And they found out that it can achieve the exact same extension, if even, if, in fact, even further, larger extension of the maximum lifespan by, by restricting specific amino acids upon the diet. You can eat as many calories as you want, right? In fact, some of the animals, they had these amino acid restrictors. They kept eating even two, two times or three times more the calories. They did not gain weight and they still live longer. So the whole thing about eating less 
to end suffering in order for you to live longer. I think it's, it goes back to this idea that for some reason the Western societies have, are stuck on it is basically no pain, nor gain, no pain, no gain, right? Um, and also this, this kind of morphed into an even more uh, perverse idea, which is basically saying now more pain, more gain. Neither one of these is necessarily true, especially the latter one is definitely not true. But the you know no pain no gain. I think there is some validity to that in life, but not not necessarily in regards to eating and extending your lifespan. Um, so these groups that are, did the original research demonstrated that you don't have to restrict the calories. You can achieve the exact same thing by by restricting some of the nutrients in the food. And also they noticed that the fasting, the benefits of fasting, are mostly due to the drastic reduction of endotoxin. I mean, basically, when you're eating food, whatever it doesn't get digested, as we mentioned in the previous podcast, is going to reach your microbiome. And the gram-negative portion of it, by consuming these undigested foods, is going to increase its turnover. And the older bacteria that dies, it will rupture and, you know, release this endotoxin into the, initially into the colon. But in subsequent studies demonstrated that over time, this leads to a breakdown of the gut barrier. So this endotoxin ends into the bloodstream and creates all kinds of chronic inflammatory problems. Um, so these groups back in the 60s knew that it's not the actual calories that really matter. It's the quality of the food, right? So the whole thing about calories in versus calories out that flies out the door. <laughs> you can actually eat a lot more, not gain fat, and live longer. Um, and I think the uh, the one the, the the specific restriction that achieved the longest lifespan extension was tryptophan restriction. Uh, and then they also tried cysteine and methionine. And I think in that order, basically, this is how this is how much you can extend your lifespan by restricting these specific amino acids. And now, because tryptophan and methionine are essential amino acids, you cannot you cannot get by by consuming zero milligrams per day of it. You do, you, you do have to eat, uh, you know, ingest some of them. But then subsequent studies found that the, the, our, our actual requirements, data requirements of both amino acids are basically really minute. Um, I, I think one study with obese type 2 diabetic people found that if you restrict the methionine intake per day to be no, no more than 2 milligrams per kilogram body weight, which let's say for somebody who weighs that's 200 pounds, that's about 200 milligrams per, you know, per day. That's a really tiny amount. But it, it was sufficient to cover the requirements for methionine and resulted in re, in reversal of the obesity. And they also mm. noticed that the subject's resting metabolic rate increased. Uh, so we have another here finding that kind of goes against the, the 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 you know the the story of the day, which is that uh, the rate of living theory. That if you if you if you increase your metabolism, this is actually going to lead to reduced lifespan because you know uh, they're saying it's it's the the analogies with the candle. You know, the, the harder the candle burns, the faster it's going to consume itself. And then basically that's, you know, you're going to end up expiring earlier. So this study found out that that's probably not the case because when you actually uh, r- r- increase the metabolic rate, these people became healthier. Now, of course, because the study only lasted three months, you can't really make a claim that it's going to extend lifespan. But at the very least, by, by their biomarkers, it, it was the exact opposite of what the rate of living theory predicts. I mean, these people's longevity biomarkers um, – and the most reliable of those are some of the inflammatory ones that we know about, especially the interleukins like one and six. They drastically declined. So these people became healthier, lost extra weight, etc. Um, so really, but, but, but since you mentioned the methane is, is present in meat, uh, the, these original groups also did tests with a vegan diet, and these animals fared the worst. So, so if you're going to be fasting, eating vegan, and over-exercising like, a, like an animal, like a, like a slave in a, in, a, in a gold mine, so to say, you're not going to be doing very well. Uh, and as unfortunately, that's exactly what's the current mainstream uh, recommendation. Basically, eat as many vegan products as you can, eliminate all animal products, right, both the fats and the meats, uh, mostly for political reasons, but now they're saying it's also healthier for you. Um, and then basically exercise as much as you can and, and fast, right, the regular fasting. Um, but none of basically, if you look at the literature, you know the yes, the, there are some studies showing that fasting extends the lifespan. But those groups, the original ones that did the research, kind of followed up on that and said, uh, well, actually, it's not just a, it's not the fasting itself. It's because by con- consuming fewer amount of food, you're consuming less of these inflammatory amino acids, and also less food means less endotoxin, you know, from the bacteria that's in the gut. Uh, unfortunately, the current political movement in the public health. Uh, basically took only one of the messages and started running with it because it really benefits their current, uh, you know, recommendations, which is that we need to drastically reduce the, the, the individual's carbon footprint. Um, and they're saying the way to do this, of course, eat less, right? Uh, exercise more um, and, you know, uh, eat uh, vegan products because those are much cheaper to produce. The vast majority of them are subsidized heavily. Um, and that's what, that's what really the, I don't know, the powers that be want us to eat. It's something that they fully control. Uh, but if you look at the actual carbon footprint of uh, sp- a specific amount of rice and a specific amount of beef, beef is actually slightly lower. 
So even there, they don't actually, the message is not backed by evidence, but that's what we are currently. So my message to the listeners is that do not torture yourself and you're likely to live much longer than somebody uh, who is basically going through these grueling fasts and exercises and veganism. Um, simply be, and <laughs> even if you don't live longer, you're going to enjoy life, right? There'll be more life in your years uh, and likely more years in your life as well compared to somebody who's really torturing themselves. Right. It's not always more pain, more gain. In fact, I, I don't know of a single case where more pain, more gain actually holds. I do know some cases where no pain, nor gain, no pain, no gain is kind of true, right? And we kind of intuitively know this in life that, you know, if you want something, you got to make a little bit of an effort for it, right? Right. But but if you're making more effort, in fact, drastically more, uh, just that's how nature is structured. The curve is logarithmic. You're going to get a drastically diminished returns on your, um, you know, effort of investment. You know, last week I did a podcast with Dave Asprey and it was interesting because we talked about exercise specifically and we didn't really get into this idea in detail of um, like high intensity interval training. But I think that there's some research that like five minutes total per week yeah. of, of high intensity exercise leads to equivalent or better cardiovascular fitness than, than six hours yeah. of training. Yeah, yeah so then, then one hour of running every day. Yep. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the the recommendation for, I believe most people was, hey, you can get a lot of cardiovascular fitness by doing something that is highly intense. And if that's climbing three flights of stairs for you, that's that's yeah. great. Yeah. Or if, if you can sprint, then you can do sprints. And so I thought, wow, like that really flies in the face of our underlying sort of overarching puritanical perspective as westernized Americans. Like I must destroy myself to yeah. be fit. Exactly. If you can go out and do one sprint, uh, like for 30 seconds a day, like a few times a week and get pretty significant cardiovascular fitness from a full out sprint, that's wild. And, yeah. and if you can't physically do a sprint, you can get on an exercise bike and go really hard, or you can just walk up three flights of stairs. Or, you know, it's interesting because I think there are people at different levels of exertional capacity and they might not have the mobility to get like full aerobic capacity, but getting people to like really intense exercise for short amounts of time, I, I love that concept. It's like, oh, you don't have to just crush yourself. Just go do one hard thing, you know, for 20 seconds once a day. It's probably pretty, pretty beneficial. And obviously, I'm not, that's not the specific programming, but I think beyond, you don't need to get crazy in the specificity no, with no. that. So, in yeah. In fact, the multiple studies that show that the chronic exercise leads to reduction of your basal metabolic rate and right. you're going to lose muscle mass, which is the number one predictor, as you know, as a doctor of morbidity and mortality. Like the, the less muscle mass an older person has, the more likely they're to die of any cause, right? At least that's what that's the studies that I'm seeing. So when you're doing these high-intensity exercises, I think the main benefit is that they're, because most of them are concentric, uh, you're actually increasing the number of mitochondria in your, in your cells. While mm -hmm. with the chronic, long-distance, kind of like exhaustive exercise, you're actually not increasing uh, the number of mitochondria. Sometimes may decrease it, but most of the effects that I see are neutral. What you are doing is you are losing a lot of muscle mass because over time, let's say if you run for an hour, chances are at some point cortisol is going to rise. You're going to run out of glycogen, right? And then you're going to start breaking down mostly lean muscle tissue. A lot of people say, oh, I'm going to burn fat. Yeah, but you're also burning muscle and actually a lot more than that because the brain needs is glucose. And then if you look at the uh, long distance runners, most of them actually kind of stop being active in this activity after around the age of 45 to 50, they just feel like they can't do it anymore. They, they feel like their body is going to break down. And a lot of them either move to like completely sedentary lifestyle or like the concentric exercise or the high intensity interval training that you mentioned, because it's simply something that's, uh, you know, more, um, more sustainable. They, it's more enjoyable and they feel like it's providing more benefit. And just for, to clarify for the listeners, what is concentric versus eccentric exercise? Uh, concentric is just a contraction of the muscle with a load. Um, mm -hmm. And eccentric is the relaxation of the muscle with a load. So when you're doing bicep curls, when you're actually flexing the muscles with a load, that's concentric. And if, if you could only do that portion, it would be more beneficial than just lowering the weight back down because the muscle is still, you know, basically tense. But now it's relaxing with a load and that causes a lot of structural damage. It's mm -hmm. very good for hypertrophy. But it turns out it's not very good for your health. Interesting. So this is this is an interesting intersection of ideas here because I, I want to emphasize something you said that sarcopenia, which is essentially being skinny fat and is the loss of lean muscle mass is a very strong predictor of overall morbidity and mortality as we age. And yeah. I've always found this to be interesting because many in the quote unquote longevity community will say, limit your protein and they don't want you to have, 
you know, the amino acids like leucine, isoleucine right. and valine, the branched chain amino acids that do trigger muscle protein synthesis. And yet, so they, they're, they're sort of encouraging people to become sarcopenic. And if you look at many of these longevity experts, they don't have a good amount of lean muscle mass on their body. Yeah. They're quite skinny and they usually have a little bit of a pot belly. So I just want to make this very clear for listeners, how do we reconcile that with, with the understanding that methionine and tryptophan or maybe cysteine might be problematic amino acids? So what is, how do you kind of wrap your head around this in your mind? Is it getting enough glycine to balance the methionine or is there a sweet spot for protein? Because I think in terms of longevity and lean muscle mass as we age, there's a clear signal that having lean muscle mass, getting enough high quality protein, I would advocate from animal foods, animal yeah. meat and organs is critical. But then there's also this signal that too much methionine may be bad. Is, is there a glycine balancing in there or is it just a sweet spot? How do you think about both of those together? So the so basically the, the branch chain amino acids have not shown the same negative effects that the uh, you know the methionine system and tryptophan have shown. In fact there are several studies when I first got into this the bioenergetic community I was reading a blog called Ergolog. It's published by a bunch of bodybuilders in the Netherlands. And they listed a study there where basically mice were being fed extra branch chain amino acids at the rate of like two percent of the food intake per day. Th those were extra on top of what was already there. And this increased the mice la maximum lifespan by about I think 15 to 20 percent. That's a lot. Uh, so it's so now we know that the branching amino acids are fine. And in fact, they're probably beneficial for us. Um, so I don't. I wouldn't restrict those. And most of those you can actually get from animal foods. They're not that well represented in the in the vegan foods. In the vegan foods, you actually get a lot more methionine. If you look at the ratio actually of the amino acids, I mm -hmm. think it's the ratio that matters. So you're getting a lot more methionine and potentially cysteine, but not that not that much of the um, muscle building branch chain amino acids and a lot of the grains are very high on arginine as well um and as we, i think we mentioned a couple of uh, uh, a couple of times earlier that arginine being the precursor to nitric oxide uh it's not something that you want to you know overdo um so really this the case for eating the animal food is to me is very strong now uh, i think the reason we need to balance it the, with the you know gelatin or the glycine these days is mostly because we don't eat the the, the, the whole animal if you are eating the whole animal you, you know, especially the tougher cuts like skirt steak from beef, uh, you are getting plenty of collagen. And those, by, by the way, happen to be like the much cheaper types of meats you get in the, in the, in the market. Uh, it's the filet mignons that are the perfect, these like tiny, tender, pure meat cuts that are, that are really uh, actually not good for us. And in fact, back in the day, if you look at the aristocracy in, um, in, in England and in, in Europe in the Middle Ages, they were using those lean cuts as food for the dogs. They thought it's not a good enough food for the aristocrats. They were eating the organs, they were eating the tougher cuts, uh, they were eating skin, right? A lot of collagen there too. Um, and um, so it's really, the, I think it's the ratio. I don't think you should be going for like complete restriction of methionine because mm -hmm. it is an essential amino acid. You can potentially get yourself in trouble if you're truly overdoing it. Uh, I mean, these people that I mentioned that, that lost all of their weight, they were obese, they were in a metabolic war. So like their doctors, there watching their intake, they're measuring their certain metabolites of methionine. And if they drastically decrease in the bloodstream, then they, they're actually going to give them methionine as a supplement. So it's not something to be trifled with. I think the way to do it um, naturally and safely is to basically balance it, just as we said, uh, with something like, let's say, gelatin. There was a study with uh, kind of unrelated, but because it was testing um, effects on osteoporosis, showed that uh, women consuming just 20 grams of collagen daily. Um, uh, basically had complete stoppage of the osteoporosis. But also, mm. if you look at, uh, they also look at some other biomarkers and some of the biomarkers of muscle breakdown, such as methylhistidine, there's one methylhistidine and six methylhistidine. These are actually, you can use this as, a, as, a, as biomarkers of anabolism. You can also do it with total nitrogen retention through urine and blood and whatnot and blood urine nitrogen. But the much more sensitive one is measuring these two amino acids. They can only come from muscle. So when these women were consuming just 20 grams of gelatin daily, the levels of these amino acids, which are biomarkers of muscle breakdown, drastically declined. So gelatin had an anabolic effect. Uh, another study demonstrated that in older people, uh, you know, even if they consume a lot of protein, it doesn't seem to trigger the, the exact same muscle protein synthesis as it does in younger people. In fact, even in younger people, they're saying that each intake of protein should be no longer than 35 grams per meal because simply you cannot utilize more. If you take more, is going to get deaminated and, and converted to glucose, the amino acids that could, and, and, and oxidized. And you don't want that. You want protein to be used for its primary purpose, which is building muscle tissue and bone and connective tissue and whatnot. So this study noticed that if you give the, these elderly people, I think it was the equivalent of about six grams of glycine daily, 
And since gelatin is about 40% uh, glycine, that was basically 12 to 15 grams of gelatin equivalent. Uh, it, it, it restored immediately the basically the the anabolic effect of protein in the muscles of these old people. So, and and when they look at the biomarkers, it lo- it it, it, it kind of looks like that the reason we're not consuming, we're not we're not se- that sensitive to protein as we get age, as we get older, is because the chronic inflammation is higher, mm-hmm. um, and and gl- the the consumption of glycine uh, lower the number of different biomarkers. Um, that are known actually to be associated with muscle breakdown, such as specifically tumor necrosis factor alpha. In fact, the bodybuilders are now older ages to, to take drugs that are TNF alpha blockers to actually prevent muscle breakdown uh, if they have like a, you know, some kind of grueling exercise regime where they're not consuming enough calories. So it looks like it's inflammation that really does us in in the long run, which of course brings a PUFA and a lot, a lot of other factors. But long story short, if you lower the inflammation in an elderly person, this restores their response to the anabolic response to protein. Um, and another study which confirmed that gave elderly people uh, the uh, NSA drug known as uh, indomethacin. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Yeah. Uh, same thing, immediately restored the anabolic response to protein. So it, it looks like we can utilize protein even in a very advanced age. Some of these people in their 90s, but we need to take care of the inflammation because if the inflammation is high, my guess at least, that my explanation is cortisol will be high. And whenever cortisol is high, no matter how much protein you consume, uh, cortisol will kind of blunt that anabolic response to the to the amino acids, uh, and, and this is kind of I think known in critical in, in clinical care in critical medicine that if you, if a person is in if you have an acutely ill person, if you give them like a, a lot of amino acids through an IV drop, it's not going to work very well. In fact, they can raise their ammonia levels too high. At least that's that's what I'm hearing. And to me, the explanation is that while cortisol is high, which it will be in a critically ill person, um, it, it, they're not going to be reacting well to the food. They will not be in an anabolic state. They will be in a catabolic state. Uh, conversely, some of the other confirmations to that are basically like that uh, it's cortisol that may be driving these things that when you give elderly people anabolic endogenic steroids, specifically testosterone, but also others, again, it restores their anabolic response to protein. Um, so it's so it's a combination of chronic inflammation and the accompanying chronic elevation of cortisol, which to me is what really kind of makes us fairly in old age. If you look at an older, uh, like really old people, uh, I mean, they kind of look like a, you know, a very uh, rapidly aged version of a pers- person with Cushing syndrome. They've lost all of their muscles, right? The skin is hanging, both of these symptoms of high cortisol, and they usually have a little bit of a belly pot, as you mentioned. Not as much as at the younger years, because at, at a very old age, they're starting really catabolizing the fat as well. But what they're really losing is the subcutaneous fat, right? Uh, the muscle mass everywhere, uh, and whatever mass they retain seems to be like kind of like concentrated around the midriff. And to me, these are classical signs of cortisol running unopposed. Um, and then if we can block that, uh, whether it's by limit by lower inflammation, which is probably the way to go, because if that's actually the, 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 the top factor that's driving the high cortisol, maybe taking a daily aspirin, uh, you know, it's something that, you know, all, uh, can allow elderly people to react well to their, you know, normal meals, and in fact, build muscle mass, uh, without being staying in this uh, chronically catabolic state. Do you think that most of that inflammation as we age is coming from the gut and lipopolysaccharide oh, yeah. and the toxin? Oh, yeah. Yeah, this is – so uh, the, uh, other studies uh, show that if you give uh, animals charcoal, activated charcoal, they basically li- retain most of their lean muscle mass and they look relatively young even in a very advanced age. Um, and the one thing that charcoal is known to do because it's not supposed to absorb into the bloodstream, so whatever it's doing, is doing it in the gut. And I don't know if anything else has happened in the gut other than the synthesis of serotonin and basically the, 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 the release of endotoxins from the bacteria, and charcoal can bind both. Um, coincidentally, um, drugs that act as antagonists of the endotoxin receptor, TLR4, as well as serotonin antagonists, have, have been shown in multiple animal studies to extend lifespan, which shows, kind of confirms that these two are really driving the aging process, uh, or at least the morbidity process, and that charcoal, by basically binding it and reducing their effect on the organism, is helping extend lifespan. So, so yeah, kind of very good, like kind of like linking of the original findings about less calories, but by looking deeper into it, you realize that it's not the calories, it's actually what you're eating. That's super interesting. I am deeply skeptical of quick fixes, but these supplements are the real deal. Check out this review on mood, memory, and brain from Hard and Soil Supplements. I'm deeply skeptical of quick fixes. My wife bought these supplements before talking to me or I would have tried to talk her out of it, but I'm glad she did it without me knowing. Our son who is 13 was struggling with mental illness. 
Although his childhood was normal, over the last two years, things became unbearable. He was diagnosed by a neuropsychologist with autism, including symptoms like hand flapping, constant verbal outbursts, difficulty learning. He was also struggling with severe OCD, long showers, dry and cracked knuckles from hand washing, screaming and violent fits over things not being right. The sickness was wreaking havoc on our entire family. Within the first few days of taking mood, memory, and brain from heart and soil, along with whole package, he dropped almost all of these symptoms. My wife and I were in shock. We repeatedly broke down in happy tears that day in response to what he was saying to us and his apparent self-control. We kept saying, we've got him back. It's now been several weeks and the changes have stuck. We never write reviews, but this has been a life-changing event. At the lowest point, we were researching inpatient care for our son, actually considering sending him to professionals when we felt we could not provide the care he needed. Now we have our son back. We are extremely grateful, cannot thank the Heart and Soil team enough for bringing our boy back to us. Moon Memory and Brain and whole package are available at heartandsoil.co. These type of reviews really make my work feel meaningful. Everyone at Heart and Soil gets to read these reviews when they come in and, and the whole team is just so incredibly passionate about what we do. If you or someone you know has mental health issues, depression, anxiety, any of these things, check us out, heartandsoil.co. If you just wanna feel better and you want more organs in your life, check us out, heartandsoil.co. We make desiccated organs from grass-fed, grass-finished cows raised exclusively in New Zealand, packaged in glass, the finest desiccated organ supplements on the planet, heartandsoil.co. Our mission is to help you reclaim your birthright to optimal health. Back to the podcast with Georgie Dinkov. This has always been something that I've found interesting about Ray's work and your continuation of it um, is that this bioenergetic perspective isn't really a fan of starchy foods. A lot of people get their carbohydrates from starchy foods, whether it's sweet potatoes or um, like oatmeal or things like this that are starchy. And as I've come to understand, is that the concern here is really that you don't want it, we possibly do not want undigested food yeah. moving into the colon because that is how that is one hypothetical way that we might increase the populations of these gram negative bacteria and then lead to increased LPS in the blood and this inflammation cascade that we're talking about. So this is kind of interesting. I mean, is this in some ways an argument for a fairly low fiber diet? Uh, not low fiber diets, but, but you can consume the fibers, but they should be mostly of the insoluble kind. If you're, uh -huh. eating, if you're eating a lot of rice and I think if you're eating a lot of potatoes, I think they do a decent amount of soluble fiber. Um, uh -huh. But the danger of thing of the starches, if they're actually, if they're the easily digestible as the simple carbs, which is what you're going to find in white rice and potatoes, if they're well cooked, they're probably not going to uh, increase much the endotoxin because they're going to get absorbed before they reach the, you know, the column. Now, right. you could have a problem in people lately because of they're taking a lot of PPI drugs, like the anti-acid drugs. So the reduction of the production of stomach acid kind of opens this pathway to the bacteria to actually start colonizing your small intestine. And that's not a good thing. Like the, I think mm -hmm. SIBO is now a, a thing, right? Small intestine yeah, bacterial small overgrowth. Intestinal bacterial overgrowth. Yeah. So if you have that, actually eating starchy foods is probably going to be problematic, even if they're the simple kind of carbs, that, that uh, you know, like white rice and potatoes. But if your small intestine is clean, I know a lot of people that can actually thrive on starch if it's well cooked and if it's consumed with a little bit of butter uh, or cheese um, or, you know, some saturated fat or, or even olive oil. Uh, but I, then I know other people who basically cannot do any starch because they immediately get the flushing reaction. Uh, they start sweating a lot and whatnot. And to me, that's a sign that basically they're having a uh, like an endotoxin uh, reaction to the starch. So it doesn't hurt to try. But I would make sure that always the starch is well cooked, and if it's and it's of the simple kind, no resistant starch is there. Like basically, whatever good the resistant starch will do, you'll be uh, uh, many times overcompensated for in a negative way by feeding the bacteria in the in the colon. That's a really important point because when people make potatoes, they're going to cook and cool the potatoes. They say right. cooked and cooled potatoes are this resistant starch, and I remember I've even people will just eat potato starch just to get this more resistant starch. So that. So what sort of foods from your perspective should people avoid that, that might worsen lipopolysaccharide from the colon? What kind of things would people avoid, like oats or? Yeah, uh, Non-fully non cooked oats. And I know a lot of people that eat them semi-raw because you know they want to get these resistant starches. They want to get the fiber. But remember, right. most of the cooking is not going to destroy the insoluble fiber. You got to cook for a very long time 
to completely destroy the insoluble fiber. So you are getting, but it will destroy the soluble one. And I think that's one reason. If, actually, if you look at the, some of the traditional cultures that are over-consuming starches, like the Tsimani tribe, which I think mm -hmm. is in uh, the Amazonian, 80% of their diet, of the calories, are from starches. They eat, they eat like tapioca, some other roots that are mo most basically like potatoes. And they, that's 80% of their calories. But they cook these things for, I don't know, for at least an hour. And it basically becomes like this paste, and it's like uh, mashed potatoes. Uh, but they're fully cooked. Um, and they, these people have the lowest incidence of cardiovascular disease known of any tribe in the developed country or not. Um, and so it shows you that you can travel starch, uh, but it needs to be well cooked. And I think that so the brown rice, the oats, um, like the, um, uh, the, the now they're selling these different types of breads in the stores that are basically, they look like they're very like, um, I don't want to go, they have, they have something, uh, they, they have nuts in them. That's another thing that I don't particularly like. But also like the flour is not the white processed flour that we're used to seeing in a regular bread. It, it looks very browning and basically it's, it's advertised that this is basically consists of, um, you know, the se semi-processed carbohydrates from wheat, but they're done in such a way that they're basically, they're not processed. So you ingest them in the raw format, which probably means they have a lot of phytic acid as well. Phytic acid, I think it's called. That's not a good thing for your, for your gut. Um, it can cause actually an allergic reaction. In fact, I think uh, a deriv derivative of it, phytanic acid, is actually used as an adjuvant in vaccines because if it gets into your bloodstream, it triggers an inflammatory reaction. So, mm -hmm. so, so these hard to process starchy foods that are advertised for their low glycemic index, that's what I would actually avoid. It's not the insulin that does you in. Uh, in fact, you do want, it's a perfectly normal thing when you're eating a very, a food with a very high glycemic index, such as white rice, it's perfectly normal to, for your insulin to spike, but then it's going to drop after that. If you are, you know, regular, healthy, non-insulin resistant person. But with the resistant starches, you may not get the, you know, as, as, as elevated insulin response and blood glucose response as you will get with the white bread. However, you will pay for that multiple times over with the high endotoxin, which is going to increase your inflammation. And at some point, you might find that your insulin, the baseline insulin is high, and you don't know why. And the doctor is saying, I don't know why. But if we measure the cortisol, you'll see that it's also high. And cortisol and insulin, uh, in, in, from what I've seen, they always go together. The role, really, the primary role of insulin is to prevent a rapid drop in blood glucose, which can send you into a coma, and basically because the brain is so sensitive to uh, to the drop in blood glucose. Type 1 diabetics know this. So they basically, they're, they're okay with insulin spiking. They'll inject, I'm sorry, with the blood glucose spiking because they'll inject insulin. They're not okay with blood glucose dropping, uh, you know, uh, too low. So, so yeah, so these, these resistant starches that are advertised for the low glycemic index, those are the foods that I, that I would avoid. The ones that are um, medium and high glycemic index tend to be less dangerous for us in the long run uh, because it's not really, it's not the carbs that actually cause insulin resistance. I think that's the biggest, biggest misconception, which I hope we are. Uh, managed to dispel a little bit. It's the fats and specifically the pro-inflammatory fats that are driving you, you know, um, obese and diabetic. Yeah. I want to get into the polyunsaturated fatty acids later in this podcast, but I think that's just important to drive that point home that, that if people are looking for resistant starches, they, they might want to reconsider that perspective. I've heard people in the health space say they want to eat green mangoes and green bananas and unripe fruit. No. And I'm thinking, that doesn't make any sense evolutionarily. We would never no have animal done that. It. No animal eats it. It eats it voluntarily. Do you know of any animal in nature that likes green bananas? I don't. Even monkeys refuse it in the zoo. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's like, why would you do that? And so you don't want the resistant starches. And and. We've, I, I believe we've talked about this on previous podcasts, but it, that's important. And if people are curious, please go back to the first two podcasts that Georgie and I did. This idea that carbohydrates lead to insulin resistance is, is just really not substantiated by the medical literature. Mm -hmm. Now, neither, I, I don't think that either of us is a fit. I know that neither of us is a fan of high fructose corn syrup, and we would, we would prefer that people eat nutrient rich whole foods. Yeah. But to suggest that honey is causing diabetes is false. To suggest that that carbohydrates from potatoes are causing diabetes is false. And I think both Georgie and I believe that it's, it's these polyunsaturated fatty acids long-term that are creating problems at the level of mitochondria. We'll get to that later in the podcast, but it, it's so backwards because there's, and I, I'll just say this and then we'll move on Georgie, because I want to get to a lot of things. There's almost become like this cult of blood glucose fear online. And there are, there are very, there are very popular people in the health space who almost exclusively post 
um, continuous blood glucose monitor readings, and I don't have any, anything against continuous blood glucose monitors, but they'll post continuous blood glucose monitor readings, and they get people all excited about mitigating that, that glucose bump after you eat and saying, if you do this to your food, and sometimes it involves undercooking your food or you know, right. doing something that's lower glycemic index, you can get less of a blood glucose spike. And there, there's a really this, they're feeding this fire of glucose fear. And I think that it, for, for humans, and almost this is not just true for people that are metabolically healthy, it's people who are on the journey to metabolic health, having a blood glucose spike is not the problem. It's not. It's in the fact, underlying it means you problem. Produce it. Yeah, exactly. You're, yeah, well, it's you're absorbing the problem. food. Yeah. What's that? I, I, I think it means you're absorbing the food well. I mean, people yeah. who, whose blood glucose doesn't spike after eating white rice or potatoes, I'll be worried about their pancreas. Maybe they're not producing amylase or something else is going on. In fact, chronic alcoholics with damaged pan they have chronic pancreatitis, they're notorious for not basically they give them a load of glucose orally and their blood glucose is like, uh, maybe a little bit, but it doesn't have that nice like uh, curvy spike. So that's not a good sign. If you're consuming glucose and your blood glucose is not shooting up at least initially, and then, then basically declines after the, you know, the influence uh, of insulin, then something isn't right. You know, it's actually worse to not have that than, than have it spike nice and, nice and sharp and, and then decline. I mean, people are doing things like allulose and they're taking medications like acarbose. And, and there are multiple people in the health space touting the fact that my blood sugar never goes above 115. I mean, there's a very prominent physician. I've heard him say that I don't care what you eat as long as your blood sugar stays below I forget what, what level he proposes, 115 milligrams per deciliter. So I think, and I think, wow, that's complete disregard for food quality. Like, how can you say that? What is that? this based like, on? What is this based on? I, I don't know of any study that showed that if you keep the blood glucose below this level, all this bonanza of benefits will, 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 will uh, you know, materialize. I, I, I don't know of a single study that says that. And, and on the flip side, I think that it's, it's, a, it's a gross overstatement and, and essentially nutritional hyperbole to say that, blood glucose spikes are the root of all evil and they're the reason you're depressed and they're the reason you don't feel good because that's normal human physiology. Now, someone could have a blood glucose spike and be diabetic and have underlying yep. metabolic dysfunction. Yep. And then you might not feel good when your blood glucose rises because you're metabolically unwell, but it's not the blood glucose spike that's yep. doing that. So I, I just want to push back on that. And, and, and in fact, if you're, if you're diabetic, you, you know, you're going to have a big glucose spike, but it will not decline. So actually having the blood glucose spike and the decline back to normal is a sign of health. I think that, that for some, somehow they're making a parallel between that and a diabetic who will have the big blood glucose spike, but then it won't decline afterwards. Those are not the same conditions. You know, the person who has a spike and decline go back to normal, that's a normal response. And that, that's how it should be. Uh, I'm be much more worried. I mean, actually, even in the diabetics, it's shown that in the diabetics who basically have, um, like, when the when the blood glucose uh, rises, um, if it if it drops too quickly, um, there there's a sign that something um, I forgot what it was exactly was, but I think it was a sign that something is wrong with the pancreas or you're overproducing too much ghrelin. So these people, who, diabetic people who had a who had actually kind of mirrored the the spike of the healthy person. Um, uh, they still had a higher than baseline glucose levels, but they had a very quick decline after after food. Um, later on, were found to have uh, a problem with overproduction of ghrelin or having this um, what is it called? Men's multiple endocrine um, neoplasia syndrome. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. One or two. Yeah. yeah. So, so it's it's you know, so it's you do want the healthy response, and it has nothing to do with the response of the diabetic person. Now, going back to this longevity thing, before we move away from this, there's. We, we touched on it a little bit earlier, but can we talk about fasting? I know sure. this gets religious for many people and I'm, I don't want to, I don't want to disrespect anyone's fasting religion. I'm just, hopefully we can encourage people to be curious and, and consider these things. But I'd like to talk a little bit about your perspective on fasting, potential downsides of fasting. And then maybe we can segue into a quick conversation about autophagy, yep. because I think that autophagy gets thrown around so much. And when you and I had conversations offline, and the more I look into this, it's, it's much more complicated than it's made out to be in the general public. When I talk to people about autophagy, they say, oh yeah, it's house cleaning. And everyone knows that it's good when I clean my house or, you know, like everyone knows that it's good to sweep the floor. Right. Yeah. And so when you, when you don't eat, it's like your body is sweeping the floor. Right, Georgie. And I think like, no way, it's much more complicated. Much more complicated. Than that. Yeah. And Cancer can... also sweeps a lot as, as some of these studies showed you. <laughs> Right, exactly. So let's talk about this and, and maybe, maybe encourage people to be a little curious about the full 
the really what's what we really fully understand with autophagy and you know and and maybe you can speak to the fact like do you think that humans need to do a lot of fasting to get optimal autophagy and is there something i think there's more to the story so the uh, the benefits of fasting that i've seen for people to actually to benefit from the fasting are people who really had a very high endotoxin response kind of mimicking what the older studies showed that most of the benefits to fasting come from the reduction of, of endotoxin unfortunately not all people can handle fasting very well I wouldn't put a fragile person who is, let's say, like, a, I mean, the way I define fragile is I would do a, a blood work analysis and see how, what the hormone levels are. If your cortisol to DHEA ratio is higher than 0 0.5, fasting is actually might actually do a lot more damage than, than good. Uh, because obviously when you're fasting, cortisol is going to rise even further. And whenever cortisol rises, that further suppresses the, the synthesis of, of DHEA. And it's the cortisol to DHEA ratio, which just like the... Um, uh, the muscle mass, which, by the way, affects the muscle mass because one of them is a catabolic, the other one is uh, anti-catabolic hormone. The cortisol to DHEA ratio is, is now recognized as the best predictor of both uh, longevity and also morbidity. So if that, if that ratio is over 0 0.5, in other words, if it starts going in favor of cortisol, you're basically looking at initially cardiovascular disease, obesity, diabetes, mm. uh, neurological disease. And if it goes you know, further higher, eventually you're looking at things like uh, cancer. Uh, in fact, uh, a recent study showed that no cancer patient had a cortisol to DHEA ratio that was below, I think, 1.5. So heavily in favor of cortisol. And we're, and we're primed to think, and I think especially doctors are primed to think of cortisol as an anti-inflammatory hormone. I know they give it to a lot of people with cancer in the hospital, right? Uh, but it looks like cancer cell, I'm sorry, the cortisol is contributing a lot to the growth of specific cancer cells, especially the ones that are difficult to treat. Triple negative breast cancer, recent study came out, showed that it's not, it may be triple negative, but it's certainly respons responsive to hormonal therapy. In other words, if you give it an anti-cortisol drug, the, basically the cancer disappears. Um, and then I think pancreatic cancer is also notorious for expressing a lot of glucocorticoid receptors. So high mm -hmm. cortisol can actually drive that. Maybe what, what ended up doing in Steve Jobs because he was chronic for his, he's famous for his chronic and, and prolonged fasts and off, both often and very long. And he was also a fruitarian. Scary, scary story. When, when Ashton Kutcher was doing the biopic for Steve Jobs, he subjected himself to the diet that Steve Jobs did. He ended up in hospital twice with acute pancreatitis, which, uh, as you know, has a very high mortality rate, but also he freaked the doctor out because that's a precursor stage to, to pancreatic cancer. And, uh, Kushner, Kushner's old doctor said, whatever you're doing, stop doing it now because I don't want you to end, to end up like Steve Jobs. Um, so, so these chronic elevations of cortisol, which will happen with fasting, um, you know, uh, are not good for anybody. But a younger, healthier person is probably in a better position to weather them on and basically kind of benefit from the reduction of endotoxin. But if you are older, like especially if you have the, the sarcopenic obesity, I mean, raising cortisol is perhaps the worst thing you can do for such a person. Um, older people are notorious for basically getting frail very quickly if they skip even one meal. They don't eat very often, but when they need their meal, if you don't give it to them, they basically can very quickly decline. Um, a bit of a, you know, actually a very sad story, but if you remember this woman that was in a vegetarian state, Terry Shaibo, I think she was called. Uh, mm -hmm. She was in a, she basically uh, fell on the bathtub, hit her head, and was in a coma in a vegetarian state for many years. Eventually, the, the husband wanted her dead, the parents wanted her alive. They fought through the courts, but eventually the court said, I got to let her expire. Well, how do you, I mean, what do you do? With, you can't euthanize them. It's not legal in the United States. So what do you do? They just stopped her food and, and she was so frail that within two days she was gone. So mm -hmm. so it shows you that it, depending on the person, you know, fasting is, is, it may not produce the benefits that are desired. And many of those benefits, you can probably mim mimic them by taking charcoal. You know, if that's really the what, what, what uh, uh, you know, fasting is does, reduction of the endotoxin and the inflammation, take some charcoal, take some insoluble fiber. Uh, in fact, you can buy some insoluble fiber pretty cheaply on the Amazon and get, eat like a tablespoon a day. That's probably more than enough. Uh, and you don't have to torture yourself. Um, invariably, I've seen that the people who benefit the most from fasting tend to be younger, leaner, and healthier. The people that are, you know, uh, you know, overweight or on the older side, basically over 50, so to speak, they don't handle fasting well. Um, they they may lose weight, but they come out of it. Uh, in fact, um, I, I, I'm blanking on the name of the study, but a study showed that, that uh, people over 50 who fasted chronically, after the end of the fast, they were at much higher risk of getting a potentially lethal infection, probably due to the cortisol, immunosuppressant, right? So they, they fasted for a long time, and then they thought they're healthier. Now they're skinnier, but the obesity paradox strikes again. It's, uh, you know, apparently for some people, it's better to have the extra weight because, you know, you know, you're not fasting and you're eating well. 
to support the immune system than to fast because if you if your cortisol to DHEA ratio is high enough and you raise it even further, um, I don't think anything good will come out of that. Don't you think also that a young person who wants to fast could achieve the same benefits by doing other things that lower LPS or endotoxin, not eating as many resistant starches that they're probably I, eating? I will start like with that, said. yeah. You know, yeah. If you get into the point of fasting, it means you've done so many other things wrong that now you're basically getting to like these desperate measures. You have to fast, okay? I mean, maybe like a couple hour fast, skipping breakfast and lunch and then eating dinner every once in a while. I wouldn't do this every day. Not like the warrior diet where you're supposed to only eat in this like a uh, right. very tight schedule, right? In between, uh, what is it, midnight and 6 a.m. And then the rest of the day you don't eat. That's kind of, that's basically the Ramadan fast. But yeah. these people do it for a month and they know very well that actually that's, that, that you, you shouldn't be doing more for more than a month. And in fact, they, they have a special exemption in the religious text saying that if you're a pregnant woman, if you're a small child, or if you're an and or sick and old person, you should not be doing the fast, okay? They actually, they can, the, the whatever their, the priest is there, they can tell you, I'm ordering you to not do Ramadan fast because it's bad for you. Allah doesn't want you dead. Allah wants you alive and, and kicking and functional. Um, so even those people that, that practice the extended religious fast, they're very well aware it, can, it does not work for everybody. And if you're one, if you're one of these people, you get a pass. You don't, you don't get to torture yourself. So benefits of fasting, primarily reduction of endotoxin, <clears throat> coming from undigested food in the colon. And, and serotonin. No food. Yeah, yeah. yeah, and you can achieve that, like you said, charcoal, reducing your insoluble, reducing your soluble fiber, excuse me, uh, reducing your resistant starches, eating more simple carbohydrates, which everyone is afraid of, honey, fruit, juice, fruit. Those would yeah. probably all achieve the same thing. Now, in terms of the cortisol to DHEA, DHEA ratio, um, is that like, would you do, just so people can do that, um, is that a, would you do like a morning fasted cortisol and a morning DHEA at the same time? How would you measure those to make that ratio? I'm thinking about my blood work yeah. and, and the units of those two also. Do they, do they have to be the I same? Think the same. I think they are the same. Yeah, they, they, okay. At least in the States, they're in the same. I think they're nano, uh, milligrams or nanograms or milligrams per deciliter. And I think it's uh -huh. the same, the same um, range for, uh, for cortisol and DHA. We are producing similar amounts of cortisol and DHA. These are the two hormones that basically once you reach puberty, uh, cortisol and DHEA are produced at, at a you know very high amount. And with aging, DHEA declines, but cortisol production does not. So the cortisol to DHEA ratio actually naturally, if, if you consider aging natural, naturally increases. Here, one uh, another explanation of why we become catabolic with age and we don't basically uh, you know respond that well to protein. Um, I'm pretty sure the, the the ranges are the same. Some countries measure them in nanomoles per liter. That's also mm -hmm. okay. Um, but basically, the you know the, the I can send you a few studies. Uh, I, you know, I think they measure they use they use the U.S. and the Western Europe uh, metric, which was in the nanograms per deciliter, and they divided cortisol to DHA or cortisol to DHA sulfate is another good measure, probably better because the DHA sulfate is a more of a longer term indicator of how much DHA you're producing, uh, and I think that ratio was 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 about the same. Basically, it should not be more than zero point five. Um, we are. Uh, the test that we're doing with my group in Bulgaria with the nail and hair shows this very well because it's a long-term measurement. But if you're doing blood tests, I will do maybe like uh, uh, every two weeks for maybe like a, a month or two and then average the results out uh, and see how they are. Because like you said, if you're fasted, cortisol is going to be higher than optimal, right? Uh, maybe the best thing is to do in the afternoon because that's when you're supposed to be your healthiest. Cortisol is supposed to be lowest, DHA is supposed to be highest. And if at that point your ratio is not optimal, then, then you're probably in trouble. Yeah, so looking at the cortisol DHA ratio, as I'm thinking about it now, it might make more sense to do that one as a non-fasted yeah. lab. Yeah. And I, when I was back in the States um, in March this year, I did, I did blood work because I like to do it as often as possible. And I was, uh, I'm always doing fasting blood work. It's just the norm. And I'm thinking, man, I, I usually eat now first thing when I wake up and I don't like not eating yeah. um, because I... Just it don't I don't feel as good, and it's something we've talked about on previous podcasts. I, I think that, um, yeah, getting more glycogen back. I want to keep the cortisol down. So I just think, wow, I'm I'm always doing these fasted blood work because I want to get lipids, and that's the standard is fasting lipids. But I think in the future I might do more blood work non-fasting, and just maybe even do lipids non-fasting, and understand that the triglycerides will not be fasting, but everything else will look a little differently. Testosterone obviously has this diurnal pattern; it's highest in the morning. People are used to looking at testosterone. That's like a 7.30 or an 8 a.m. testosterone. So interesting stuff though, but maybe the cortisol for DHEA ratio, if people, I mean, that's an interesting predictor of overall stress. Overall, I think more people should more do that. Morbidity and mortality. And for males, a similar test, which male specific was cortisol to testosterone ratio. It should be less than 10. 
Um, yes. And uh, several studies show that people with PTSD, specifically males, have a cortisol to testosterone ratio that's 30 or higher. And in fact, some of these people, when they're given testosterone therapy for unrelated reasons, their PTSD resolved. So it shows that the PTSD really is like a chronic stress that cannot be remediated until the, the endocrine framework is rebalanced back to normal. Um, yeah. It's, it's, so, so some studies are actually now testing DHEA supplementation for PTSD. Unfortunately, in males and less so in females, if you take a very high dose of DHEA, a lot of it will convert to estrogen. Uh, not so much with testosterone because even though testosterone is a precursor to estrogen, in fact, a direct one, testosterone itself is a moderately strong aromatase inhibitor. So it will kind of inhibit its own conversion to estrogen. You may still raise it, but DHEA is much better than that, and it's not, not, an, it's not an effect we want. But still, it shows you that the anti-catabolic hormones for males and for females have this, this plethora of beneficial effects, both metabolically and mentally and as a longevity, as in general frailness and, and everything else. Let's talk about autophagy real quickly. This is an eye-opening one for me. You know, do you need to fast to get autophagy, Georgie? I don't think so. And some of the studies that I showed demonstrated that, in fact, sucrose, trechalose, fructose, and I think maltose, several sugars, when they were administered to the animals, the levels of, of autophagy rose. Uh, so it's not something, yes, sure, when you're when you are basically fasting, the body has to get the calories from somewhere. And what is it going to do? Probably a, a, a good adaptive response is to consume the sick cells, right? The ones that are sending signals that are, you know, I don't know, they're, they're hypometabolic or they're about to turn cancerous and whatnot. So I think that's a good effect. But for how long? I don't, I don't think any study has, uh, has looked at basically at what point does fasting induced autophagy become, become detrimental. All they've seen is that, yes, sure, in the first six hours of fasting, uh, the autophagy rates are greatly increased. But what happens afterwards? What happens if you, if you actually fast continuously? I don't know of a study that looked even at uh, uh, every day for six hours continuous fasting effect on autophagy. My guess is that at some point, the body will downregulate that response simply to preserve tissue, right? Um, and keep your life for longer. So uh, like anything else, uh, I think every uh, every intervention that we try to trick the body into uh, or with uh, has a diminishing return on investment. And I think the same, the same is true uh, you know, with fasting. Um, I know a lot of people who basically like to eat in the morning, get, have a very you know, decent breakfast, and they don't really feel hungry until like five or six in the evening. And then they eat their dinner at around seven, then they go to bed at nine and they wake up in the morning and they eat another one. So with two meals seem to be, you can be in a mild caloric deficit without basically lowering your base, basic basal metabolic rate too much, and you can still get the autophagy and the end um, uh, you know, effects of fasting without actually being fasted. You know, these people don't feel hungry to me, which is an indication that their blood glucose has not declined that much. And I think people should also remember that if you're sleeping, most people are not eating in the middle of the night. Yeah. So, you know, last night I go to sleep pretty early. Last night I went to sleep at 8.30, I got up around 5 a.m. Um, you know, I had a little bit of goat's milk and honey maybe an hour before I went to sleep. Um, and then I had some food pretty soon after I woke up. I still had a 10 hour fast, you know, <laughs> like, okay. so I think that it's not so much that people think that they're going to get enough autophagy overnight while they're sleeping. They're thinking they need to do like a 16 hour fast every day or a 24 hour fast or only eat once a day to get autophagy. And I think, well, wait a minute, do we really know how well calibrated these autophagy mechanisms are? As you point out, some of the foods that are nutrients that we're taking in trigger autophagy mechanisms. Yep. Glucose, sucrose, this is triggering some cellular house cleaning. Glycine, then, glycine does yeah. it too. Yeah, so. so that's actually taking in nutrients, triggering some degree of house cleaning. And then most people are getting an eight hour fast or a 10 hour fast overnight. How do we know that's not enough time? And then as you pointed out in our conversations offline before this podcast, there's some, there's at least some signal and we don't really fully have this understood in the literature that, that perhaps too much autophagy could lead to negative cardiac remodeling at the level of the heart. It is maybe even like a precancerous type of thing. In fact, there, I think there are several trials now where they're basically using drugs that block autophagy and they're hoping to stop the developments of some, I think it was mostly of the gastrointestinal tract, which is a very interesting thing. It means that too much, too much autophagy in your gastrointestinal tract, in, in gastrointestinal tract is probably not a good thing. Um, um, and um, uh, I guess the, the cells there, they need their energy. And if you don't give the energy through the food, uh, then yeah, they may end up consuming each other, but then it's not necessarily a good thing. 
uh, you know, that, that actually is one of the core features of cancer. A study that I posted on my blog a couple of months ago showed that cancer cells are very good at devouring the mitochondria of healthy cells around them as basically as a source of fuel. That is a type of autophagy. Unfortunately, they're consuming the, the, the normal healthy tissue as well. So we don't know enough about the process to be stimulating it beyond the baseline, which is uh, what happening while we're sleeping, right? And also in between meals. I mean, I know studies have shown that you do have, you do trigger autophagy um, if you basically have at least three or four hours between meals. So I don't know of a, of a good reason or argument scientific that we should be increasing it beyond that because, you know, we're triggering a lot of catabolic processes that, um, you know, at some point may get out of hand. Cancer is one such thing. Um, it's, you know, probably the epitome of the catabolic processes and autophagy is highly expressed in most types of solid tumors, not so much in the hematological ones, but the solid ones. So until we know more, I would not, you know, try to increase autophagy further by, by fasting. And fasting, by the way, another thing that's known that in people with established tumors, yes, it does make the tumors more sensitive initially to chemotherapy, but if the fasting continues, eventually the tumors become very, very aggressive, stop responding to chemotherapy, metastasize, and invariably kill the patient. So I think that's one reason why even mainstream oncologists, they will tell you, do not fast, okay? When chemotherapy or radiotherapy, whatever you do, do not fast. Eat your things. Steve Jobs was notorious for getting into these big fights with an oncologist who was begging him to eat some protein. The guy would not eat protein. He would only eat fruit. Uh, and the oncologist said, look, you, cancer is already eating you out from the inside. Unless you consume some protein, that process is going to be accelerated that much you know, more. So eat some protein. Anyways, it's a, I can say the articles in the popular press how Steve Jobs thought he knew better. And the doctors, listen, you may be a genius in IT, but I'm telling you, you know, you compose the cells. These cells need protein. You don't need protein, then you become the food for the tumor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I want to get into cancer and cancer mechanisms in a moment. But before we move on from that, let's talk about metformin for a second. Because, <laughs> I mean, I'm not taking metformin, Georgie. So I'm, I'm, I'm going to die early. <laughs> no, you, we should not be drug. taking so what do you think about metformin? Uh, meta known metabolic inhibitor. I mean, I can send you a hundred studies that show that metformin is administered in multiple studies because it's a known inhibitor of complex one of the electron transport chain. And that's perhaps the, co the one complex that is with, with, with complex four, probably close second, the one complex that is known to be inhibited in every type of cancer. Uh, now, and it, ironically, they're promoting metformin not only for for increasing lifespan, but also as an anti-cancer, as a cancer-preventing, um, you know, uh, uh, medicine. Now, but formin, and it's more dangerous because it's fenformin, they have a black box warning for causing potentially lethal lactic acidosis. Definitely not something that sounds like you should be taking on a regular basis. Now, and the way they cause lactic acidosis is by inhibiting the metabolic flux from glucose to, to oxygen. Um, now, nobody really knows the exact mechanism of action of metformin, uh, when it comes to diabetes, it's known that it lowers blood glucose, but metformin on its own is known to not be able to cure the diabetes. So whatever it does, it may just simply be masking the symptoms. It may have an anti-inflammatory effect. Um, some studies demonstrated that it may actually lower lipolysis, which is what, you know, so less free fatty acids in the blood. And of course, that means the cells will have more opportunity to burn glucose. But if that's the case, if that's the benefit of metformin, you can do it by, by taking aspirin, by taking niacinamide, by taking... God, okay, sucrose, you know, because it will trigger insulin. Insulin's primary effect is anti-lipolysis, anti right? So there are many other ways they can do it in a, in a more, um, in, in a healthier or less risky fashion. More, important, more importantly, the long-term studies with metformin have not shown the expected benefit in terms of reducing risks of cancer, reducing risks of diabetes, reducing risks of cardiovascular disease. So the only thing we know is metformin seems to lower blood glucose in type 2 diabetics, but it's not a so-called disease-modifying therapy. Um, so I don't know why these people are taking it. Maybe because it lowers blood glucose, and that's part of the mantra, right? Whatever you should do it. Yeah, you got to lower the glucose down below a certain level. So, I mean, um, and by the way, if the doses from metformin is really effective for that, you are reaching the danger zone of causing lactic acidosis, which has a 30 to 40% mortality rate if you get to that level. So even with treatment, I mean, I don't know what do they do. Do they give bicarbonate in hospitals? Like if you get into they lactic? do. Okay. So, yeah. but even with that, I mean, if if it's basically if it's got a, because lactic acid, lactic acid when it builds up, it causes uh, I think pseudo pseudo hypoxia because it actually prevents you from from uh, utilizing oxygen properly. Uh, also blocks the the like the pathway from glucose to oxygen. So if the I think if sufficient amounts of of, blood, of lactic acid accumulate in the brain. 
I think that's probably what does most people, uh, what destroys most people. I mean, mo the other organs can process it through the core cycle, which can go through the liver. But I think of the brain cells, because they're so sensitive to metabolic deprivation, if you get a sufficient amount of lactic acid in your brain, that's it. And metformin is known to have a high risk of dementia, which to me kind of confirms this link that, you know, it's doing something metabolically mm -hmm. that may be on paper beneficial for diabetes because it lowers the blood glucose. And that's the biomarker that everybody's chasing. But the long-term effects of it so far, neither one of those promises. I think metformin, there's a foundation, non-profit in, in the U.S. that was formed specifically to test the metformin uh, for longevity promoting purposes and anti-cancer. They got millions of dollars of donations. And so far, they haven't published a single study, even though they've done a lot of experiments. The only thing that could mean to me, the only sign to me, I mean, the only explanation to me is that these studies did not demonstrate the desired effect. And so much of this conversation about longevity for me is just comical and voodoo and hand-waving saying, oh, these things are going to extend life. Well, okay, check back in 75 years. Exactly. Like yeah. you're gonna be, yeah. <laughs> we can't hold you accountable for that. Like yeah. it's just these, this speculation, like, and you know, basically I think we need better biomarkers and you hit on a really important point. I think we're chasing the wrong biomarkers in diabetes and that has everyone confused. I don't know if there's any studies looking at metformin and fasting insulin. like give people metformin and actually look at their insulin sensitivity, look at their fasting insulin and see if that improves. If we just chase fasting blood sugar, this is not the end all and be all in diabetes. And it's sometimes it's just sort of a, it's a, a symptom. symptom rather exactly. than, it's a, symptom. It's a it's symptom. It's not actually the thing we want to fix. And I think it leads us off track over and over and over. And, and that's a problem with metformin. Metformin also leads to vitamin B12 deficiency in some oh, cases. Yeah. Yeah. So like, wh wait a minute, what is it doing here? It's, it's, a, it's a chemical that I believe is derived from the French lily yeah. Um, and so it's in some ways you can make the argument, this is a, this is a plant defense chemical that is not good for humans. And, and you know, if you take enough of it, it will, it does have a lethal dose 50. And there's so many, there's so much of this in the medical literature. They, they paint something as positive because it reduces blood glucose. Yeah. But maybe at this point in the podcast, the biggest takeaway for me is like, just because it says it reduces blood glucose doesn't mean it's good. That's, that's actually a bad thing. That means your body is not getting nutrients that exactly. it needs. Yeah. Yeah. You know, glucose is a nutrient. You know, fructose and glucose together and sucrose and plant foods, that is something that humans need and animals need. Reducing that, just because a plant compound reduces that, we chase this in diabetes and think that's a good thing for diabetes, but that's actually depriving us of a nutrient. We should welcome the glucose influx when we actually understand what that does to the body in terms of a signal of abundance. Low blood glucose and admittance in the hospital is one of the most reliable predictors of dying in, while in the hospital. And, and I think there's a reason why when you go to the hospital, even in the ER, and they put you on a, some kind of an IV drip, they don't put you on a lipid drip. And, and I don't think they don't even put you on a, on, a, on a amino acid drip. They may later if you cannot eat, right? But the first thing they do is what? Glucose and, and electrolytes, right? Things like that. So, so there, there's a reason for that. Um, and I think the, uh, uh, what was that uh, blank in the name of the doctor who said, when a biomarker becomes a target, it ceases to be a biomarker. So you're starting to chase something that's really was meant to tell you whether something is okay or not. It's not meant to be chaseable, right? Um, you know, you just use it to evaluate whether what you're working, what you're doing is working. I think, but the reason why we're, we're here is that currently mainstream medicine does not have a good idea of what's causing the diabetes. They've, they've zeroed in on the sugar. And that, in that case, it makes sense to chase blood glucose. But as I, uh, many of the studies that I showed you, I think I showed you uh, those uh, of the newer drugs that are um, GLP-1 inhibitors, I think they're called. Yeah. Uh, the lower blood glucose by any means necessary. These drugs increase all-cause mortality in the long run. So it's it kind of shows you that it should, we shouldn't be messing with glucose directly, whether it's inhibiting the absorption in the gut, whether it's increasing the excretion through the kidneys, which is I think some other drugs do that, right? All of these things are not are not beneficial, at least uh, based on the studies that we have so far. So we should be looking at something else. What's causing this, you know, increase in blood glucose? And to me, the evidence, the parallel evidence, because it's not hidden, it's there. It's been there for decades, shows that hyperlipemia, basically, it can cause reliable diabetes. In fact, to this day, making animals diabetic in animal studies has two established uh, protocols. One is they administer a drug called streptozotocin, I think it's called. Uh, to b destroy the pancreas, and that gives them type 1 diabetes. For type 2 diabetes, they, they feed the animals high-fat diet, and specifically high PUFA diet. They don't change the glucose calories. I don't know of a protocol that causes diabetes by eating, by eating high-sugar diet, right, by keeping fat, fat uh, low uh, or, or, or stable. It's actually the other way around. So this is established in all the animal protocols we know. 
feed the animals disproportionately high amount of fat, specifically the pro-inflammatory ones, and within three weeks or four weeks, they become insulin resistant. Within two months, they become diabetic. Now let's talk about that. I want to get, we'll get back to cancer, but let's just talk about what you think causes diabetes, because this is really interesting um, that, that, that lipolysis inhibitors can fix diabetes. I mean, that's wild, um, mm -hmm. but let's just get into this and, you know, maybe, maybe talk about polyunsaturated fatty acids. We've done two podcasts and I don't think we've really talked much about seed oils because I've talked about it on other podcasts. So let's, let's dive in here. Like, what do you think is actually, if, if it's not blood glucose, if it's not glucose, um, which I think we've established. And then you and I have talked about also studies from the 1940s, I think, Walter Kempner, I think the, the white rice study where he fed yeah. people white rice and yeah. sugar, and they lost hundreds of pounds. You know, the diabetes is cured and reversed so that yeah. they can eat, you know, uh, more, uh, more, uh, a more varied diet when they're done. So like giving people pure white rice and sugar caused a resolution of diabetes. So that's a separate thing that we don't need to get into. But what do you think actually causes diabetes for people? Yeah, if you said this thing to your medical exams, they would have probably thrown you out, right? They would ask yeah, you, yeah. hey, Paul, how do we cure diabetes? Feed them more sugar. <laughs> They'll think you're joking or something, but that's what the studies show with humans, right? Um, so there's a drug on the market, which is, is approved, but it's not very famous, but it's, it is approved that it's in the States and most other countries called ACPMOX. Uh, a, C is in Charlie, I, P is in Paul, I, M is in Mary, O, X is in X-ray. Look it up. It's basically a minor derivative of, of niacin, of niacin, vitamin B3. And just like niacin and niacinamide, its main effect, admitted, you know, public, publicly proposed mechanism of action, it's the inhibition of lipolysis. And when you give this drug to people with type 2, di type two diabetes, their triglycerides drastically lower, their free fatty acids drastically lower. Their blood glucose lowers not, not long after that. It may take a week, but then after blood glucose eventually lowers in, in the presence of still existing obesity. So, so something is, what's going on here? What, how can a person with, with type 2 diabetes can, can be brought down to normal blood sugar levels and normal um, lipid profile uh, in the presence of still you know, morbid obesity? So it means that the fat that is circulating, that's the most reliable explanation based on the mechanism of action of a CPMOX, is doing something to the cells to prevent them from utilizing glucose. And that's something yeah, was uh, defined, uh, I think, initially in the 1960s by a uh, gentleman named Randall, and it's known as the Randall cycle. And the Randall cycle says that there are only two macronutrients at any point in time, actually in general, that the cell can metabolize for energy. One is glucose, the other one is fat, right? And then even the glucose, people say, well, what about protein? Well, even protein can get metabolized to glucose and then, you know, through that pathway, but still, but glucose and uh, fatty acids are the two terminal macronutrients that, we, that the cell can oxidize. And the Randall cycle says these two nutrients compete for access to the cell's metabolic machinery, and they have an inhibitory effect on each other depending which one is present there in a relatively more abundant concentration. So if you give more fat, then basically the fatty acids through the process of beta oxidation, uh, they lower something known as the NAD to the NADH ratio. In other words, they're going to increase your reductive state. They increase the amount of NADH. And the NAD to the NADH ratio controls how well the enzyme pyruvate uh, dehydrogenase works. And that is the rate-limiting enzyme, uh, assuming all everything else is healthy. That's the rate-limiting enzyme of, of the metabolism of glucose. So if you have a lot of fat, if you're oxidizing a lot of fat, this puts a break on the metabolism of glucose and... Uh, but it's, it's basically, it's a point of entry into the mitochondria. The glucose will still go through glycolysis, and the end product of glycolysis is two molecules of ATP and pyruvate. Now, pyruvate sits there and waits for the pyruvate dehydrogenase to pick it up and metabolize it further, put it through a Krebs cycle, the electrotransport chain eventually meet oxygen. But if that enzyme, pyruvate dehydrogenase, is not working, pyruvate accumulates. Now, because the cell needs a certain amount of NAD to the NADH ratio to function, in other words, if that ratio drops too low, the cell can die. So the cell says, okay, I'm, I'm building up too much NADH. What can I do to get more NAD? And the cell says, well, in this emergency situation, since I cannot get to oxygen, which is the oxidant that can oxidize NADH back into NAD, what other oxidizing agents do I have around me that can do this trick? And that is pyruvate. So pyruvate acts as the emergency oxidizing agent for NADH through an enzyme called lactite dehydrogenase. So pyruvate oxidizes NADH back to NAD, but in the process becomes lactate. And coincidentally, all the people with diabetes, all the people with insulin resistance, all the people with cancer, cardiovascular disease, etc., they have higher than, norm, higher than optimal 
levels of lactic acid in the blood. That demonstrates that there is an impediment of, to the metabolism of glucose. Now, uh, inhibition of pyruvate hydrogen is not the only thing that can cause lactate to rise. Just as we discussed, metformin can do it, but, but how does it do it? By inhibiting another step, but still, inhibits one of these steps, and you're going to get a buildup of lactate because the metabolic precursors are going to build up, and eventually pyruvate will build up, and that results in a buildup of lactate. So, the, so th these studies demonstrated, that, I mean, Rendell Rendo demonstrated that you can actually control the cell's metabolic flexibility by providing relative overabundance of each one of these nutrients. So that means that if you, let's say, let, if we assume for a second that the diabetes, the inability to oxidize glucose is basically caused by oversupply of fat into the cell, then anything that, that we can do to either limit the supply of fat or increase the relative abundance of glucose relative to the fat should have therapeutic, therapeutic effects. The studies you, with, with, uh, right, or, or, or with white rice you found confirm that. The studies that I sent you later on like the one pound of uh, candy sugar daily on top of the normal diet restored fertility, even in morbidly obese men, I think that also confirms that. Uh, the drug ACPMOX, which actually, so it doesn't increase glucose supply, but it limits the supply of fat. So the over, relative overabundance of carbs will still be there. So it does the exact same thing. So we have plenty of aspirin, by the way, a uh, very, very famous study gave people a massive amount of aspirin, massive according to current standards. It used to be using much higher doses back in the day, 90 milligrams per kilogram. That means somebody that that's weighs 200 pounds will have to consume 9 to 10 grams of aspirin, and they did give these to people. Morbidly obese type 2 diabetic people, uh, 9 to 10 grams aspirin daily. After two weeks, complete restoration of insulin sensitivity and blood glucose and, and the lipid profile in the presence of remaining morbid obesity. So, so they managed to cure diabetes while these people were still remain fat. And it's when they stopped the treatment, then basically the symptoms slowly return. What does aspirin do? Well, it's another well-known lipolysis inhibitor, but it also has an anti-inflammatory effect, which means it's probably going to end up in re reducing cortisol, which is also known to be higher than optimal in diabetic and obese people. Um, the salicylic acid metabolite of aspirin is a direct inhibitor of the enzyme 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase type 1, which means it will directly inhibit the synthesis of cortisol. And if you Google 11 beta HSD1 inhibitors diabetes, 11 beta HSD1 inhibitor of obesity, 11 beta HSD1, whatever you, disease you can come up with and, and proceed that search with 11 beta HSD1. In other words, the overabundance of cortisol is behind as a partial cause of diabetes, obesity, and many other conditions. So aspirin by blocking excessive, by reducing excessive cortisol, reducing inflammation, and reducing lipolysis, managed to fully cure these, these people's diabetes for a duration where they were taking it. Did not cause lactic acidosis like metformin does, right? Um, and in fact, the people felt energetic. Uh, I think it improved their mood as well, uh, which is commonly low in people with diabetes. That they, some of them, I think like 30% have depression or something like that. So, so it's, we have multiple pieces of, indif of, of, of evidence independent, by the way, they, did, they didn't cite each other's research, which tells me that these people were not influenced by each other's work. They discovered these things independently through different pathways, which shows that the oversupply of fat, whether it's through the diet, again, reliable method of causing diabetes in animal models, right? Or through, over, or through a, a higher than normal lipolysis, which can happen under stress, which can happen if you don't consume sufficient amount of, of uh, uh, carbs in the diet because it's insulin that actually keeps excessive lipolysis from happening. Um, if you fast, which is another thing, which is going to raise cortisol and adrenaline and, again, fl flood the blood with uh, free fatty acids. So all of these things ultimately lead to a state where there is an overabundance relative of fatty acids. And then, um, you know, um, I've, I've argued this with other doctors to say, okay, so hold on a second. Um, why does this so, – so if we lower this and the diabetes disappears – so, um, you know, but but um, I think the argument is, okay, so what can we do to cure it? Because when we stop these interventions, basically the, the symptoms return. And I'm saying, well, as long as the stores, the, the fat stores contain overabundance of fat, and the majority of that fat is polyunsaturated, whenever these fatty acids flood the bloodstream, you're going to have the exact same condition. First, oversupply of fat relative to glucose, and also the inflammatory effect of these fats by, you know, by the, uh, you know, uh, uh, prostaglandin and the leukotriene pathways, these things by themselves can actually aggravate in some cases even cause the diabetes. There are studies with animals showing that if you inject prostaglandin directly into the animals in sufficient amounts, you can cause diabetes. Actually type 1 diabetes because the prostaglandins apparently in sufficiently high amounts can destroy the beta cells of the pancreas. Um, so there's plenty of evidence demonstrating that the fats and the inflammation is what directly causes the diabetes. There are studies that show that if you can reverse somehow this obesity, basically you're curing the diabetes. 
And there are studies showing that even without reversing the obesity, if you limit the effect, temporary effect of these fats that we are carrying or getting from the diet, then you basically don't have diabetes, at least temporarily. It has nothing to do with the blood glucose. In fact, you should be aiming to, to raise the blood glucose by providing more blood glucose, maybe, and then you may have a therapeutic effect. And this was known as far back, I think it's like the 1890s. There are old studies that I can show you that Ray Pete quoted on his website from um, some hospital in London, where basically they were, they were treating people with high doses of sodium salicylate, which is just another ester drug of, of kind of like a similar to aspirin, and the oversupply of massive amounts of sweet tea. So sweetened with sucrose. And the British loved their tea, so they were drinking gallons of it daily, sweetened, and these people were fine, even type 1 diabetics. So that was, that was amazing. Thank you. I know that was kind of technical for a lot of the listeners. I'll just try and summarize it. And basically, we can backstep to where we're, we're actually getting close to the roots of diabetes. But the idea is that excess lipolysis, excess free fatty acids in the blood trigger the periphery, whether it's the muscles, the liver, the brain, to become insulin resistant. We know yeah. this. We know. I mean, one of the things that we can even measure in humans is what is the, the NIFA, the non-esterified fatty acids in the blood? What are the free fatty acids? And when you're doing ketosis, when you're fasting, if you're limiting carbohydrates, you will see the free fatty acids go up. And that's a physiologic insulin resistance response. It's not the same as a pathologic insulin resistance, but it is going to raise cortisol. And that, as Georgie talked about on previous podcasts and a little bit on this one, when you're fasting, when you're doing ketosis, you will raise 11 beta hydroxysteroid dehydrogenase, which is going to lead to excess cortisol. Mm -hmm. And so you're, you are triggering these sort of stress mechanisms when you limit carbohydrates. But ultimately, it's the excess free fatty acids in the blood that cause the periphery to be resistant to insulin. That is insulin resistance. That is diabetes. There's actually a very fascinating... Have you heard of Dunnigan familial lipodystrophy? <laughs> Uh, no. Are these people like basically getting very fat on very low calories or? They're, it's really fascinating. It's a single gene mutation in the LMNA gene. So it's a monogenic form of diet of insulin resistance. Okay. And what it does is it causes excess free fatty acids in the blood. So this is, these are people who have, um, increased, they have basically have massive insulin resistance with not elevated diabetes, with not elevated blood sugar. And it's a single gene that does this by elevating the free fatty acids. It's a really interesting condition. Um, and they have increased rates of cardiovascular disease with no increased levels of LDL. They have normal LDL, increased levels of cardiovascular disease because they're insulin resistant and it creates excess free fatty acids in the blood. And people with um, lipodystrophy get, they're, they're like, they have a, a six pack, but they have a, a turtle shell. They have like a ton of visceral fat and they have um, very lean extremities, so they kind of look like a reverse turtle. And, but they're very insulin resistant. And this single gene, it's a monogenic form of insulin resistance, and it leads to excess free fatty acids in the blood. So basically, we know that it's dysfunction at the level of the adipocytes. It's dysfunction at the level of our fat cells. That's what causes diabetes, because that's where these free fatty acids come from. You can get it from your diet, but most people aren't just like chugging. You really don't create Cups excess oil, free fatty right? acids. Yeah. What's that? <laughs> They're not chugging cups of oil. They're not uh, chugging cups of oil. And, and even people in the keto community who, who pretty much do chug cups of oil are not going to get like, they're, they're mostly going to get it, you know, for other, for other reasons. Probably the cortisol is triggering the lipolysis at the level of the fat cells. But so it's dysfunctional, broken fat cells that are leaking these free fatty acids into the blood. And that's what's causing diabetes. And I think it's like, it's just what we talked about earlier. The medical establishment is so fixated on the blood glucose levels and I don't, it's, it's very clear, it's clear as day in the literature that it's not the blood glucose, yep. it's the free fatty acids. And so if you step it back one step further and say, why are there excess free fatty acids in the blood? We talked about it, excess cortisol, but I think this is where the PUFAs come in at the level of the adipocytes. Don't you think that yep. like, it's the excess polyunsaturated fatty acids in the adipocytes, the fat cells, because yep. fat is a cell, like every other cell in the body, your fat cells store fat. Um, and I think that there's interesting evidence that excess amounts of these polyunsaturated omega-6, even omega-3 in some people, fatty acids in humans is what causes these fat cells to get broken. And that leads to excess lipolysis and inflammatory mediators. Would you agree with that? Absolutely. In fact, I forgot to mention that the PUFA specifically are known to block and act as antagonist of the insulin receptor, which means that these fatty cells, because insulin is the anti-lipolytic agent, the main one that we have, the other one being basically the sucrose that we consume, but it still works through insulin. So Insulin's role is to kind of stop these fat, these fatty cells from releasing their mostly PUFA content into the bloodstream. But in order for insulin to be able to do that, 
uh, it needs to act through that insulin receptor. And the fatty acids are blocking that, specifically the PUFA. So you're getting insulin resistance at the level of the fatty acids, which means lipolysis cannot be inhibited properly. Um, it can with a much, much higher dose of insulin. In fact, that's what they do when they go to the hospital with diabetic ketoacidosis. They treat you as if you're type 1 diabetic. I think they pump you full of insulin, much higher than what you would normally produce in order to basically kind of like override this insulin resistance at the, at the fatty acid level. And that's what reverses diabetic ketoacidosis. Um, so, yeah, it's the PUFAs and also the inflammatory effects of the PUFAs lead to the increase of, as we mentioned, a higher than baseline cortisol. Cortisol is notorious for blocking the insulin receptor as well. And several drugs on the market, uh, they were approved for other, other reasons, but the uh, abortion pill, ario 486 my Fepristone, which was developed as a glucocorticoid antagonist, actually blocks cortisol receptor level. Uh, several studies independently found peripherally because they were given it for other reasons, that this thing can actually not only lower blood glucose, but lead to re resolution of fat of, of obesity in even very obese people, such as with Cushing disease, full-blown Cushing disease of pituitary origin. Um, and several other studies found that it can actually reverse type 2 diabetes and obesity, even in normal non-Cushing disease people. And several animal models have confirmed that as well. So we know that cortisol is involved and the PUFAs can actually both directly block the insulin receptor and the insulin activity, and also promote cortisol by increasing chronic inflammation. Both of these two things, the Elevated cortisol and the antagonism of insulin at the receptor level, I think these two are sufficient to actually cause diabetes while the situation is continuing. So you can probably cause this, all the symptoms of diabetes by giving a continuous infusion of polyunsaturated fats to, to an organism. And there's some, there's some evidence that it has already been observed clinically because some people are on so-called total parenteral nutrition. And they found out when they're in the hospital, and if the fat actually contains more than 40% polyunsaturated fats, it increased the mortality of these people. They were there for different reasons. They weren't diabetic. But whatever these PUFAs are doing, we're drastically, <laughs> well, we're increasing the frailty of these critical ill people and killing them at a much higher rates. So I think now they're basically they're resorted to replacing the high PUFA seed oils with still seed oils, but genetically modified to be high on the oleic acid, to kind of mimic olive oil. There's a high oleic sunflower oil. There's high oleic soybean oil, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But even the you know clinic, critical medicine, which to me is like really the most established portion of the medicine, has realized that the PUFAs can have a very detrimental effect on sick people. And they, they've monitored them. They've seen that it increased the non-esterified non-esterified fatty acid levels. They've noticed that it increases the insulin levels in these people even when they're not fed. So okay, so why am I insulin going when I'm giving these people nothing but a lipid drip and amino acids? Well, because the amino acids are blocking the insulin, the receptor level, the body says, oh, I'm insulin resistant. I need to pump more insulin. So it starts to produce, you know, even more insulin. Um, and we're seeing kind of the same thing with cortisol, just to this, this insensitivity of the receptors. We're seeing something similar in depression. Depressed people have higher than baseline, uh, higher than normal levels of cortisol. And they're so-called non-responders on the dexamethasone suppression test. Means that if you give them the, the synthetic cortisol, their normal cortisol levels don't decline. Why? Because the body doesn't feel that it's being given extra, extra, uh, you know, extra, extra uh, cortisol in the form of dexamethasone. Same thing happens with the PUFAs in the insulin. So when it, the more PUFA you give the organism in the form of free-floating non-esterified fatty acids, the more the body thinks that it's insulin resistant, it's going to produce more insulin. But also, in addition to the, the PUFAs uh, blocking, basically stimulating cortisol, as we said, because insulin and cortisol almost go hand in hand, if the body is producing more insulin, uh, it's also going to increase the production of cortisol because it doesn't want insulin to lower blood glucose to the point where it can cause hypoglycemic coma. So hypercortisolemia and hyperinsulinemia, in all the studies that I've seen, always go hand in hand. If you can lower the cortisol side of it, you usually lower the insulin side of it as well, unless there is a, a you know a different a reason like a I don't know tumor in the pancreas producing insulin or, or some other some other source like a, a pathological one. But you know and, and the PUFA can trigger all of these cycles just by being inflammatory and anti-insulin um, and just like any other fatty any other fatty acid outcrowd glucose through the Rendell cycle for metabolism. And I think we talked about this on a previous podcast, but did you mention that when you are crowding out glucose at the level of um, the, the metabolic sort of uh, branch point in humans, that the polyunsaturated fats do that more than saturated fats? Yes. Because people get worried about eating saturated fat 
and sugar together. I hear this all the time. People say, you shouldn't eat fruit or honey and meat together. But I'm pretty sure it was with you. There was a conversation that we had that, that the polyunsaturated fats are more to blame for this flipping of the switch in the Randall cycle toward fat than the saturated fats. Is that true or am I making that up? It is, and also the, the polyunsaturated fats, they themselves are actually lipolysis promoting, which is a unique among the fatty acids, while the saturated ones are anti-lipolytic. Um, and the reason is because the, the polyunsaturated fats mimic structurally estrogen. Estrogen is a great increase increaser of lipolysis, um, and women that are taking birth control pills or, or hormone replacement therapy with estrogen are known to have higher than optimal non esteric fatty acids and are at higher risk for developing diabetes and cardiovascular disease. So the unsaturatedness of the molecule, uh, it, it appears that that's, that's a contributing factor. It mimics the, estrogen, the estrogenic effects of estrogen, and one of those effects is increasing lipolysis. Another one is that the, the, some of the degradation products of the polyunsaturated fats uh, they're aldehydes, both of them. One is malondehaldehyde, and there's like actually two more. When they look at the plaques of the blood vessels that basically eventually can cause heart attack or stroke, 80% of that was accumulation of those uh, toxic byproducts of polyunsaturated fats. And when they tested these two aldehydes, it demonstrated that they have a profound anti-metabolic effect. They immediately caused hyperglycemia in animal models when they were injected directly. Um, and my take on it is that, and this didn't happen with other fats. So they're doing something at one of the steps, maybe powered by the hydrogenase, maybe the electron transport chain complex, but they're very good as metabolic inhibitors, exceeding metformin in terms of effectiveness. And the saturated fats did not display that effect. It was only the potent saturated fats, but the more potent uh, effect was seen with their aldehyde byproducts, the products of the oxidative destruction of these unsaturated fats. And yet Harvard University says, don't eat saturated fat and eat canola oil. <laughs> Did you see the I, FDA uh, announcement that came out in 2019 that said you should no longer worry about dietary cholesterol? It has no impact on your cardiovascular disease risk. By the way, the study that they based this recommendation on was not only about cholesterol. It was also about saturated fat. And they had the same conclusions. But the FDA decided to leave that recommendation unchanged. They ignored that part of the study. And they said, yeah, don't worry about cholesterol. You can eat as much as you want. It's the endogenous cholesterol or something else happening with the cholesterol. But just like, just like you said, these people with the, with the genetic mutation, they have norm, normal levels of LDL and still develop cardiovascular disease. So again, LDL is probably just a symptom. It's an innocent bystander. Something else going on under the scenes. And now we have this evidence. I, I was shocked when it's on the Wikipedia page. I'll send you the, the, the page that show that these two aldehydes of uh, produce some linoleic acid are comprised 80% of the plaque. Um, and though they are very inflammatory. So which means cortisol is going to be increased and you know all, all kinds of other things. So cortisol, by the way, is known to cause vascular stiffness by activating the mineralocorticoid receptor. Um, and this is this was known as early as the 1940s when the first anti-aldosterone drug known as uh, spironolactone was invented. They noticed that it was, it, it, to this day, is used to treat heart disease and heart failure. But they noticed that basically when you give spironolactone, uh, the, the arterial stiffness is either completely inhibited or in some cases reversed. So it's basically something through these receptors that's happening. And, you know, cortisol is known to activate those receptors in higher amounts. So when you're increasing inflammation in cortisol, you're going to get your vascular stiffness indirectly um, through, the, through the chronic inflammation. Um, and that process is no. Uh, I, just, I, I, I just don't think nobody has sat down and put together the different dots. Or maybe they don't have a reason to. You know, they have billions of dollars worth of drugs to chase glucose. Until these drugs are completely proven to be ineffective, they're not going to be removed from the market. <laughs> so this is interesting. We can bring this full circle as we close here. If we go back to the rice diet, mm -hmm. and I'll have, um, we can put the, the study or some of the studies on the screen so people can see it if you're watching on the video, or we can put the, the references in the description you and I were talking about this a little bit offline. I think it's so fascinating. So what happened in this study is that they basically gave people a very high carb, extremely low fat diet. And I was thinking about this and we were, we were thinking about it offline and thinking that we know that when humans eat polyunsaturated fatty acids, and the main one that we worry about is linoleic acid and seed oils, that these accumulate in our cell membranes. And so the hypothesis here that we were sort of thinking about is, if you give people a very low fat diet and that diet is exclusively basically glucose and some fructose because white sugar is fruct is sucrose so it's glucose and fructose and this diet was predominantly white rice and white sugar that's a, almost essentially what it was and so you're giving them a very very low fat diet is it possible that the reason this is effective at 
essentially curing diabetes. Because as I mentioned earlier, when people stopped this extreme diet, and there was some controversy around this diet, like the doctor who was doing the diet may have had some questionable ethical practices <laughs> to get people to adhere to this type of a diet. But the science of it is, is what's interesting. I'm not condoning his, his actions. Um, apparently, he might have whipped people to keep them on this white rice and sugar diet. But, but when, the, when the diet, what's that? <laughs> Maybe he cured them. I mean, the, the yeah, end justifies yeah. the means. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's, we're not condoning that. But the science is interesting that like the, the idea is that if you give people this super high carbohydrate diet and they have no, no fats, does that, could that possibly accelerate the turnover of cell membranes and, and accelerate the, the removal, it's just a hypothesis, of these excess polyunsaturated fatty acids in these people's diet. If you look at the photos, which we'll put on the screen, they're striking. The weight loss is massive. Mm -hmm. and, and, but what, what was most interesting for me was that when they returned to a more varied diet, their diabetes did not come back. So they, they did look like they had improved metabolically by eating nothing but white rice and sugar and maybe a few other things. So I wanted to get your take on this. I thought this is really interesting. Like if it's possible, if, if it's really just the accumulation of these polyunsaturated fatty acids in the cell membranes, I don't think this is a good strategy for humans long-term, but it might prove the point that that's what the problem is, that they might have been removed or turned over faster by doing this crazy diet. I, I think, I mean, there's, it's a very valid explanation. And in fact, I think the, the, the correct way to get rid of the PUFA, which is already accumulated, is to basically not oxidize it because it's going to create a lot of these oxidative uh, toxic byproducts and it's also metabolic inhibitor in itself and it's procortisol and so on and so on. The way the body naturally gets rid of the polyunsaturated fats is that when they pass through the liver, the second phase, um, the liver, a healthy functioning liver, attaches to them either glucuronic acid or sulfate group and it makes them more water soluble and you basically excrete them with, with your urine. Um, and the foamy urine, which some people get in the morning, um, some, I know a lot of, uh, some doctors have said, well, that's actually a sign that you have protein in your urine. Actually, it, the protein doesn't foam that much. So it, the, the foaming is because uh, taking these fatty acids and attaching glucuronic acid and sulfate mm. to them makes them like soap. So that's, in fact, so when you, because you've been fasting all night and the levels of free fatty acids are rising, uh, and whatever your liver manages to actually get a hold of and process, you're going to pee out and your urine will be foamy. It's also a good sign that you're under stress. I think your urine is foamy during the day. Uh, chances are that you have higher than normal lipolysis. But the point here is that uh, you can actually, by, by helping the liver, by keeping the liver healthy, and it's been shown that increasing the amounts of carbohydrates in the diet is actually beneficial for the liver, not harmful, the way being told. It's the PUFA that's damaging the liver. Uh, you can actually help the liver increase the capacity of the liver to process the polyunsaturated fats. Now, since the fats that we synthesize from carbohydrates, uh, it's palmitic acids, fully saturated, uh, and the cells have a preference for it, um, we're eating these very high low-fat diets, uh, very high uh, carbohydrates and low-fat diets. I think the palmitic acid that you're synthesizing, it's going to gradually displace the polyunsaturated fats that are in the cells. But I think the bigger benefit, and, and of course, this gets they get released, um, but the bigger benefit is that if you have a healthy liver, which is what happens with high carb diet, you'll be able to excrete the majority of the PUFA instead of allowing it to circulate and poison all of the other tissues metabolically or peroxidatively um, by being uh, attacked by the uh, uh, hydroxyl radical and the, what is it, the super anion. Um, so, yeah, so my, I think it's a combination of both the, the carbohydrates uh, creating more saturated fat and displacing the PUFA and also helping the liver excrete that PUFA instead of allowing it to circulate and poison the organism. Wow. Yeah. Okay. So we covered a lot today and I know you've got to go. Let's just wrap this up for people. So every time I have Georgie on, I always learn a lot. Thank you for coming on. And, and we always get really technical, but I want to just make it kind of digestible for you guys. You might have to listen to this one a few times. You can listen to the first two I've done with Georgie as well. Or if you have questions, um, you can submit those to info at carnivoremd.com. And we're going to be doing, I'm going to be doing a lot of question and answer podcasts in the future. But I think that my takeaways from this one are, you don't want to eat resistant starch. So don't eat green bananas. Don't eat unripe mangoes. Don't eat undercooked oats. Don't eat, you know, a, al dente spaghetti. If you do have gut issues or you do have inflammation, charcoal might help with that. Fasting, maybe not great for humans. Um, some benefit for those who have reserves, but again, you can achieve perhaps the same benefits of fasting by reducing the amount of LPS coming out of your colon, um, by charcoal, by eating more easily digestible carbohydrates, fruit, 
insoluble honey. fiber, like the carrots. Yeah. Uh, so most of the root vegetables actually have, a, have a, a both a decent amount of insoluble fiber, and also because they're growing on the ground, they've they've evolved to produce a lot of antifungal and antibacterial enzymes and substance in them. So you may be getting like a combination of an antibiotic, like a charcoal or antibiotic, and the insoluble fiber by eating turnip, by eating carrots. Uh, even some of the potatoes, I think, may have that because they're also growing on the ground. You want to make sure you cook them really good. So if you're going to cook white rice, much better than brown rice, cook it really well. Maybe even pressure cook your white rice and potatoes. Don't fear meat. Um, plant proteins are probably not great because the methionine to branch chain amino acid ratio is not great. Get collagen, preferably gelatin or things like this. Um, I'm actually... If I were going to get collagen from a powder, I would do a gelatin powder rather than a hydrolyzed collagen powder. Um, I think that's probably going to be better for humans. And then we talked about polyunsaturated fatty acids. That's the root cause. Don't fear glucose. Don't fear glucose spikes. Yep. Yep. I would not, I'm not a fan of metformin. I don't think Georgie is either. <laughs> Longevity conversations are mostly bunk. And what did I miss, Georgie? What are, what are like high level take homes can we give people here? Uh, eat like your grandparents and don't fret too much. I think that'll be my recommendation. Just you know, because yeah, the stress yeah. is, is can kill, can cause a lot of this damage. Uh, it's it's really pernicious because it happens, uh, you know, with small increments over like a long time. So a lot of people don't want to give stress. It's it's needed uh, credit to the fact that it's a, a major cause of these diseases, mainly through the increased lipolysis and which means overexposure to the polyunsaturated fats because these these fats are mostly coming from your from your tissues. Um, other things, make sure you have fun. Uh, it's been shown that people who, who are spontaneously gregarious and enjoy like, uh, you know, mentally enriching activities, they tend to not only burn more calories than people who are actually stressing themselves through like, I don't know, exhaustive running and what, uh, but also they, in the long run, it seems to be more beneficial. The brain consumes 40% of your calories of, of your daily intake. So if you're doing mentally stimulating <laughs> activities, you'll be burning, you'll be doing a lot of exercise while also enjoying it. So do fun things, sprint. Um, uh, maybe you don't do... climb stairs. Uh, yeah, swimming is not is actually mostly concentric, and because you cannot move that fast in water, it kind of prevents you from some part, partially this overexertion that can happen with something like running. Um, mm -hmm. So what else? Biking. Uh, as long as so when you're doing these that are more endurance level sports, um, uh, I would I would limit them to the point where you where you're glycogen bound. Uh, once the glycogen is depleted, and you'll sense that because there'll be for about 30 seconds, there'll be a very notable drop in endurance and muscle strength b before the body switches mostly to burning uh, fat, uh, then I think that's that's the time when you need to stop. Because after that, if you're basically going into burning predominantly fat, then, you know, it's a, yes, yes, we can do that. But remember, if we're burning predominantly PUFA, all hell breaks loose. So you want to limit it to that level. So if you're doing the biking and, and, and swimming and anything, or maybe rowing, I used to be a rowing coach, also also mostly concentric exercise. And I could sense that, and we'll be on the river for hours, but after about the first hour, then you know it became really grueling and unpleasant <laughs> activity. Uh, and I think one of the reasons was that basically I was running out of glycogen and, and switching to, uh, uh, to burning fat. Um, and the coaches kind of knew that. They had like these power, used to, they used to sell these called power bars. I don't know if you remember them. In yeah, the I remember those. Yeah, they had these in the boat. And whenever we start feeling exhausted, they'll give us, you know, uh, the ones that had the, the, it was the high sugar variety. Um, yeah. So sugar is, is known as very important, even, even among athletic coaches. Uh, they don't want you running entirely on fat. Sugar gets a bad rap, but as we've talked about in previous podcasts, there's, some, there's perhaps some nuance there. And high fructose corn syrup is not the same as sucrose. And there's natural sources of easily digestible sugars like fruit, honey, and fruit juice that probably are great for most humans. Um, yeah, I, I appreciate all of that. And I think that it's important for people to understand, and we, didn't, we don't really have time to go into this fully in this podcast, but we can on a future one, that you can burn fat while you're eating carbohydrates. That if you're in a ketogenic diet or you're limiting carbohydrates, people say you're burning fat. Well, you're burning the fat that you're eating. Yeah. You're not necessarily burning the fat on your body. Precisely. And even if you're doing lipolysis and burning the fat on your body, that's a process that is often going to lead to the lipolysis of the oxidation of polyunsaturated fatty acids, which is not a good thing. It's, it's possible the quickest to way lose to get weight. NAFLD is to yeah. actually be in a chronic ketosis. In fact, another well-established model for doing NFLD in animals is either feed them the high-fat diet or do the chronic fasting. 
Um, so it's known on, in animal research that this, the chronic fasting through the increased lipolysis is not a good thing for your liver. And once your liver gets fattened, that's your primary defense mechanism against the PUFA that is circulating, whether from the diet or from your, or from your, uh, you know, from, from your fatty tissue. Uh, and if that happens, then the only thing you can PUFA do is circulate around until it gets oxidized. And that process never leads to anything good. Uh, Georgie, uh, this is the last question, then we'll wrap it up. Do you, are you aware of any evidence in humans that fructose leads to non-alcoholic fatty liver disease? Because no. I had I had Dave Asprey on last week, and he was saying, fructose, you don't want to eat too much fructose. And I thought, well, I'll ask Georgie about this. I'm not familiar with any evidence nope. in humans that that's a problem. But nope. I think I the reason is that this. they're claiming that that's the case because fruct fructose has a um, basically higher uh, – it triggers the, the release of triglycerides more easily than glucose does. But it doesn't lead to NAFLD. In fact, I can send you several studies showing that, uh, uh, you know, uh, administering higher amounts, again, of, of, of carbohydrates, whether through uh, pure starch, which is pure glucose, right, or sucrose or honey can actually reverse fatty liver disease. Um, mm. um, fruit That's juices amazing. are about 70 to 80 percent fructose. So, especially from the ripe fruits, but I want to emphasize the ripe fruits because the unripe ones have a lot of citric acid and a lot of other metabolic inhibitors, which, by the way, the plants are releasing to uh, discourage the animals from eating the, these fruits. So we shouldn't be eating them either. Anyways, uh, uh, pear juice, apple juice, grape juice, uh, mango juice, orange juice, they're actually 70 to 80 percent fructose. Um, so, so when you're consuming these and the plenty of studies with humans as well, they should be, you know, causing any FLD epidemic everywhere, and they're not. In fact, it's, you know, there are several studies with humans now showing that if you inhibit lipolysis and or increase the supply of carbohydrates, that actually has a beneficial effect on the liver. Um, it's really the increased lipolysis, increased fatty oxidation, because the liver is the organ that has to deal with that. So whenever you have, whenever you have that going on in your body, whether they're releasing the toxic aldehydes from the peripheral cells because they're, they're, they're trying to oxidize PUFA, or it's just a PUFA floating around, Basically, the liver gets the burden, carries the burden of detoxifying you, even from the things that are inside of you. Uh, and if the liver is not working, this, by the way, this process of detoxification takes its toll. It can, if, it can, if you overburden the liver's capacity to process the PUFA, to glucuronidate it and sulfate it, the, the other thing that the liver can do is actually start storing it inside of itself. And once that capacity is reached, then the liver starts to re-esterify the free fatty acids and release them back as triglycerides to be stored again into the fatty tissue. Uh, so it's liver health is really at the core of type two diabetes and obesity, uh, and I think I don't think it's, I don't think it's a coincidence that every single person with one of these diseases also has some form of, of fatty liver disease, NFLD or NSH or even to up to the cirrhosis level. And it, it, so just so because we've talked a lot about the liver, I think the one of the main things people can do to keep the liver healthy is limit the polyunsaturated fatty acids. Limit the polyunsaturated fats. Yeah, nothing. I mean, I don't know. If there's a cell in the body that can benefit from from polyunsaturated fats, and conversely, that, that would not benefit if you restrict the polyunsaturated fats. Um, old, old study, uh, I think it was done by German scientists in the 1950s, showed that if you limit the polyunsaturated fat intake below 1% in animals, cancer cannot develop. Um, I think enough said. Uh, and also there are multiple studies with uh, animals that have been made so-called essential fatty acid deficient. Mm -hmm. So they were depleted of their PUFAs through consuming, again, either very high carbohydrate, a very, very low fat food or um, uh, food where all the fat was 100% saturated. These animals are remarkably resilient to all kinds of assault. They can withstand seven times higher than the lethal dose of radiation in non-essential fatty acid deficient animals. That's huge. Uh, they can withstand um, a, do a, 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 do a lethal dosage, dosage of lipopolysaccharide because it can, can be all, often used in animal research to trigger, uh, I don't know, like hyperthermia or like... Uh, uh, retching and like and vomiting and whatnot, they can withstand 20 times the LD uh, of uh, uh, an LD50 of, of, of what the animal can normally take. Um, they're re extremely resilient to a number of different carcinogens that are commonly used to tr uh, trigger several liver, several cancers in animals, including liver cancer. There is something called carbon tetrachloride. Uh, that's a very well-established uh, um, chemical for causing liver cancer very rapidly in animals. And the animals that are essential fatty acid deficient almost never developed it, even no matter how much you inject them with that. In fact, they die from the toxicity of the chemical through other uh, means than, you know, before they develop liver cancer. Uh, they're extremely resilient to uh, neurological conditions. Uh, there are several models of causing Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's disease, or even ALS in animals. It cannot be caused in animals that are essential fatty acid deficient. So nothing essential about those fatty acids. The only thing they do is actually they make you a very compliant, obedient person who can get fat on very low-calorie diet. And that's exactly 
what the powers that be really want us. They want us to get by on the minimum amount of that of, of food possible. Uh, it's called the food efficiency. Uh, in agriculture, in livestock breeding, food, high food efficiency, which means getting your animals as fat as possible on fewer on fewer calories possible, is great, right? Because you're spending very little on food. Oh uh, so the same thing is, for some reason, has taken hold on medicine that they think that we should be like that, get by on the minimum amount of food possible. And it's actually the opposite that is a measure of health. How much can you eat without getting fat? And the higher that number is, usually the healthier you are. Uh, I mean, I think we all remember when we were little kids. You can eat whatever you want, whenever you want. And we didn't pack on a single pound, most of us, right? But with aging, that started to change. And I think that's, you know, the, there's a lot of evidence that the process is driven by PUFA, inflammation, the, the catabolic hormones such as cortisol, which is catabolic for the muscle, but anabolic for fat, etc. So basically eating more saturated fat, limiting polyunsaturated fatty acids makes us into the best version of ourselves. Yep. Uh, um, if, we, if, if the animal studies translate into humans, which I think there's a good amount of evidence to suggest that they would, then, then these animals were much more resilient to all sorts of insults when they were, you were saying, they were saying essential fatty acid deficient, which is just their, the research way of saying they had very, very low levels of linoleic acid. Yeah. And if you, if you don't trust the animal studies, look at how, our, when I said eat, eat like your grandparents. And the reason I said it is that the so-called greatest generation, and I think to, to a degree, the silent generation and less so the boomers, I think really the, 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 the carriage started getting out of the road with the boomers. Um, they consumed the early the generations that were basically in their adulthood in the early 20th century up to the middle of the 20th century. They can, the fast they consumed are mostly of animal origin and mostly saturated. McDonald's and KFC used to fry their fries in beef tallow. Uh, butter was like the, 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 the cooking oil of choice in probably the majority of the houses. It would, you'd be hard pressed to go out in the store and find some processed food that did not was not made with saturated fat. You know, around the late 50s to early 60s, this changed completely in favor of the seed oils. And our health has been declining ever since. Is it the only factor? Probably not. But the, the fact that the curves the, of the uh, incidence rates of the various diseases and the, and the increase of the consumption of seed oils, the fact that they overlap so well suggests that it's a, it's a big factor. Georgie, where can find, people find more of your work? Thank you for coming on the podcast. Thank you. Uh, probably the best thing is you. to uh, check my blog. Um, uh, I have a blog and I post under the alias Hey Dude. It's H A I D U T uh, dot me, M E. So that's the blog, my blog, Kaidu dot me. And that feeds into Twitter under the same tag, uh, twitter.com slash Kaidut. And whatever I post on the blog, it goes on the Twitter. And I, I sometimes engage with the public on Twitter if they have questions about the studies. Thanks for your work, my friend. It's always good talking to you. Thank Hopefully you. Appreciate I'll see it. You Thanks for inviting me. Thank you.